Hello and welcome to the OLM issue triage meeting. Today is Thursday, April 1st. Um, today is the first meeting where we will focus exclusively on the open GitHub issues that we have against uh, the different OLM repositories, including Operator Lifecycle Manager and Operator Registry. Um, today, I, I've asked Joe to, to help us with the, the triaging since Joe has a lot of experience doing this on the Operator SDK side. So Joe will help walk through the issues and we will collaboratively triage them and hopefully uh, get our back, burn through some of our backlog and help understand the issues that are affecting members of the community. Um, so with that, Joe, uh, would you like to go ahead? Yep, sounds good. Let me share my screen. Let's hope this works. Okay, do you guys see the issue, the uh, agenda? Yeah. All right, cool. So um, we talked about this a little yesterday just to make sure that um, this was something sane. So I think what we're gonna do is basically just take the first half of the meeting and start going top to bottom in the open OLM issues. And then we'll spend the second half looking at operator registry issues. Uh, so let me open this one first. Uh, so the way that that we've run this in the SDK and we we think will be a good plan for OLM as well is just basically top to bottom. Uh, we've got a lot of issues right now and we hope to burn those down and get to the point where we're basically just looking at new issues every couple of weeks. Uh, but for now, while our backlog is so big, uh, we're just going to start with the newest things and look at those. Uh, and the plan really here is to um, align or assign each issue to a milestone. Uh, and we've got uh, milestones for upcoming releases and then we have this backlog milestone. So the idea is if we think that it's an issue that we wanna tackle in a certain release, we'll put it in that release milestone. And if it's something that maybe isn't really aligned with a release or something that we don't really know when we wanna do it or a super low priority or something, then we'll put it in the backlog. And then every so often, perhaps like once per release cycle, we'll go into the backlog and, and pull things back out. And then obviously if folks um, in the community have specific questions or wanna talk about things in the backlog, that's something we can do too and we can potentially reprioritize you know, if, if folks want to. So with that, uh, let's just open the first issue and we can just start going down. Okay, so OLM dependency doesn't always deploy operator from the default channel. Has anyone seen this one yet? Uh, have any comments about it? Uh, hi, uh, actually I opened this issue and uh, I found in our IBM product. So when uh, one operator depends on another one and uh, it not always uh, get the default channel got installed. Sometimes it will create a, a channel, it will create an operator with a channel that has the same version as a uh, of the CSV as a default channel. So I saw there is already a PR created for this issue. Great, so it looks like we've pretty much got this triaged. Um, we just probably need to assign it to a milestone. Um, I th so I think we're planning to release 018 fairly soon. Do we have the link to the PR here? Is that what this is? I, I, I posted a link. Yeah, I think you have it uh, right there, yep. Okay, so I, I think the question basically is, is this something we think we're gonna merge before releasing 018 or we wanna put this in the 019 milestone? I think 018 is probably not gonna release for another week, maybe a week and a half. Uh, it seems like this is something that I can just, I actually was just looking at it. I think it's probably just gonna merge the next like day or so. It might be worth putting it 018 just because it okay. seems like- I'll put it in the 018 milestone. Cool, all right. Any other topics or things we wanna talk about there? Sounds like no, seems like we're pretty good. All right, next up we have 
The operator cannot be installed normally in a cluster with pod security policies. Let's see, no comments here yet. I think uh, if we just go up to the top there, it's the installation of OLM that is failing uh, because the job uses the default service account and maybe the pod security policy prevents users from using the default, uh, pods from using the default service account. Is that maybe the issue? That sounds like that could be right, yeah, let's see. I guess the, the thing that's not, yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on here. I guess the thing that's not clear to me is what, what Kubernetes clusters have this pod security policy by default? Right, we could probably get around this problem by uh, having the upstream install be um, like create its own service account, but I don't know if that's something we actually that want seems, to do. That seems reasonable. I mean, is there any reason why that would not be a good idea? I, mean, I don't know if I would yeah, call this a bug necessarily. Seems more like a new feature, which is um, use a different service account. Yeah. This is, I, I think we're. I think it's like working as intended, but it's not working for every use case. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the pod security policies themselves are being uh, deprecated. Uh, I think the newer version of the PSP, the, like the PSS, it'll be similar type of problem probably. Um, just maybe worth pointing that out. Okay, so this sounds like something we probably want to do. Um, it probably sounds, unless, unless someone is willing to put in the work to make this happen quickly, this doesn't sound like something that's super urgent. Um, so my hunch would be put this in zero nineteen zero. That makes sense to me. Um, so the other thing, so the other thing that we, we have done on the SDK side is if it goes into a milestone, then we try to assign someone to it. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to, to sh either shepherd this and do the work themselves or try to find a community member that would be interested and willing to make this change and, and then kind of mentor the community user on how to do that and where to look. So how would that, so are you, sorry, what I'm trying to understand, your suggestion is uh, attach somebody's name to this thing? Yeah, I mean, we don't have to do it the same way. It was, it, it was nice. Um, on the SDK side, because that way, like there was one person that the community could go talk to, to figure out like, hey, I'm interested in working on this, or when it came time to go do the release, if it wasn't done, like we know who to ask effectively. We don't sense. have to do it that way though. Why don't we try? Okay, do I have any volunteers? Uh, I mean, you can you can uh, tag me. That's fine. Okay. Oops. I tagged myself, and then I clicked on my profile. Okay. Um, we are we saying it's not a bug? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, how, so another thing that we do that we like to try to do is, um, if it's something we think could be tackled fairly simply, we can ask community members to, we can basically put a label like good first issue or help wanted or something like that. 
Um, do we think this is a candidate for that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is just like a manifest change, right? So it should be fairly straightforward. Cool. Yep. I think I agree. Okay. Does that look good? Good first issue, help wanted, kind feature. All right. Next, we have the correct way to add additional cluster role bindings for operand service accounts. So this seems potentially more like an SDK issue, um, which is effectively like, how do I get multiple, see, these are role bindings. Well, it seems like they may have a, a fundamental misunderstanding. They may have a fundamental misunderstanding of the relationship from operand roles versus operator roles. I know with our own products, we had that same problem for a while. Because I don't think OLM should be creating roles for the operands at all. Right? It should be the the controller doing that dynamically yeah or through its own mechanisms right yeah that sounds right yeah in the csv you would only ever want to put the roles and cluster the permissions and cluster permissions that the operator needs to do what the operator does yeah so i think the education here is that the operator is going to run with some sort of security domain and then the operand has to run in a subset of that security domain, but not necessarily the same security domain. So OLM has cluster admin, OLM delegates to the operator, which has a subset of cluster admin. That operator gen generates operands, which have a subset of that operands security domain. That's the way I think of it anyway. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right to me. Uh, is that how OLM actually works? Like, will OLM, if, I, I think this is right, right? Like if OLM creates an operator that says, here's my cluster permissions and permissions. And one of those permissions is the ability to create additional RBAC stuff. Kubernetes basically enforces that you can only create more RBAC for RBAC you already have permission for, if I remember correctly. Yes, they prevent privilege escalation. Right. Or elevation. Okay. Um, so this sounds like something maybe we just want to put in the backlog. And if, I don't know, Chris, if you'd be willing to put a little something here about what you were basically just saying and um, see if there's any response about that. We could usually, yeah, this type of thing, we'll, we'll put something in them if it's been a week or so with no response. We can close it out. Yeah, J Joe, you're getting like a lot of static on your audio all of a sudden. AirPods are okay. Let me switch. It, is this saying that the issue is with the operator SDK though, not generating cluster role appropriately for the operator? in the CSV? I'm, I'm reading under what I expect to see. Yeah. That's or sorry, a, under what did you do? Sorry. 
I think part of this is a, I, I don't know if it's an issue with the SDK or if it's just a uh, education problem with the SDK. I agree. I think there's something to be said about, I think this there's some confusion here about how to generate cluster roles and that are back inside the CSV as opposed to um, roles and role bindings as files in the bundle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're not going to want to, we, we made this mistake <laughs> early on, is that you don't want the permissions and cluster permissions in the CSV to have anything to do with the operand, right? So the service account that gets generated by that is for the operator. If you want to generate these things, so the operands, they should be in completely separate files. So I think you can have a, even have the service account in a, in a, in a manifest, right? uh i'm almost I'm certain pretty sure you could, yeah. yeah yeah so you could in theory put roles and roles bindings and cluster role bindings and a service account in your manifests in your bundle and you could make that for your operand if, assuming your operand is going to be in the same namespace or something there's no problem doing that but they should definitely be separate yeah i can and if you agree with that then i can i can put that in the comments <clears throat> yeah i think that makes sense so I think I think what we're saying, let me just reiterate to make sure I'm understanding this. We're saying that anything that ends up in the bundle, whether it's in the CSV as permissions or cluster permissions, or is as a separate object in the manifest folder, all of those things are for the operator in general. If you have any roles and role bindings and service accounts that need to be created or provisioned or reconciled as part of your operand um, usage, that should be kind of coded directly into the operator. Is that what we're saying? Uh, That's what yes, I think I we're think saying. So. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm going to put this in the backlog. Um, do we have a support, like a, like a support label? Yeah. Um, and we'll say backlog. And Chris, you said you could follow up on this. Yep, I'm typing right now. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Next up, install plan failed because of error updating CRD. Yeah, so this one is one that we have uh, actually a uh, ticket in our sprint addressing this issue where it's basically uh, a transient error trying to install uh, the CRD, but really any object in the install plan step. Um, I think this one is can be considered triaged and uh, potentially part of the 018 release since it's in our current sprint. Cool. Um, is this is Ben working on this one? I believe I believe so. He he owns that uh, UX epic. Okay. Um, cool. Let's see. Is there any PR for this yet? It doesn't look like. I don't this think so. Either. I think he just started looking at it like yesterday. All right. All right. So I think we're good here. That was quick and easy. Next up, control config map change while update from cluster service version. Uh, so it sounds like he's the reporter is asking for an update in place around config maps. I, I think this is well, so I think 
uh, if I was to distill this slightly, they want to be able to actually use the fact that you can create a config map in the bundle as a way of defining state for the operator installation. And I think that there is some problems with trying to have a combination of user and non-user state there that I don't know that we necessarily want to solve. To me, what this is actually begging for is a CRD that has user configurable stuff in it. Um, and maybe there's something to be said about like a desire for like that to be somewhat um, configurable by default, but even then um, that might just be stuff that's logic inside the operator on startup. I don't, I don't know uh, that that makes sense as a blob in the bundle. Right. That uh, assessment seems right to me. And I, and I agree with you that there's probably a, another, that this is not the way that you probably want to go, but more like what you said, having a feature where you can, um, where the users can manually configure installation of the operator that would be persistent across upgrades. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say this real quick. It seems to me this is ha having a you know, component focus on upgrade. And I feel like this is the operator can condition essentially sound like a better fit for this already than actually having a config map. It's literally config map page, like holding, like Kevin said, holding certain stages and pushing certain, you know, status. And then somehow I'm supposed to be understand those status and what or not and doing certain upgrade or installation. And you can do, do that with the operate con um, condition. Yeah. Just a thought. I'm not saying that we have. No, to no, I, I know what you mean. I it just like to me, like to me, the problem with this request, even more fundamentally, is just that um, how does OLM make decisions about which things to two way merge and which things to not two way merge? Because I think there are going to be cases where someone wants to use this feature and have the state from local changes override the state from changes in the bundle during upgrade. And then other folks are going to want the exact opposite. And I don't know that, um, I don't, I, I guess, I, to me, this just feel really strongly feels like custom logic that an operator should be implementing itself. Um, and if that's true, it should just be a CRD. Yeah, but if this is more like, I, I mean, the way that I'm reading this is it's, it's configuring how the operator is going to run, right? So like, let's say I have a uh, <coughs> configuration for my operator that says, say, these are the images that I'm going to use when I install an operand, whether those are defined through an environment variable or a config map. And I, as a user, want to change that because say I'm a developer and I'm testing out a fix that I'm making in one of those and I want to just go in and tweak that, right? That doesn't really have anything to do with upgrade, but I could see if you had other features where your operator itself was configurable by the end user who's installing it, because they want to, you know, uh, customize the behavior of the operator, then, I mean, that's how I'm reading this, right? I have a config map, this configures how my operator runs, and we allow the user to change settings or add settings, and that changes behavior. And then when we go to update, all their changes are lost. Yeah, I think another thing that this plays into, we, we've seen some feature requests, or at least I have for like what if my operator like requires, for instance, like a license key to run, right? Um, that's like something that has to be provided basically in advance of the operator doing anything useful. You could argue whether that's something that the operator should just wait for when it starts up or whether it should crash if it doesn't have what it needs. But regardless, it seems like there's this class of user provided configuration for the operator um, and, and maybe it does make sense to allow the operator to deliver like a default configuration that then can be overridden. But I agree with Kevin. It seems like trying to do those things in the same exact config map seems like, you know, exactly what he said. People might want it one way or, 
or the other in terms of what's allowed to override the other thing. Um, okay, so to me, this seems like a long-term, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. This seems like something that might be interesting to solve. It does seem like we have, there's a use case for user provided, um, well, operator author provided defaults and user admin installer provided overrides. And we wanna have a, a feature around that. Does that all seem right? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. So we've had a story for operator configuration before. Um, I don't remember what became of that, but this also surfaced again um, when we were talking about uh, RBAC. So I think Evan's on the call, but um, we were talking about uh, leaving it up to the operator author to sort of um, templatize the RBAC that needs to be generated for a cluster admin to um, grant access to a particular user in a particular configuration to use an operator. And it seems like a natural extension of that thing is this sort of um, parameterize my operator uh, and show that template to the cluster so that um, users can actually like uh, fill it out rather than having to like guess what the operator needs. Um, I, I feel like that would wrap nicely around into the configuration story here. Yeah, I think there's some overlap with that, uh, Nick. I think there's, I, I'm also interested in this um, from the installation side, because I think that that seems to be where we get a lot of requests where it's like, uh, when I'm installing my operator, but before it's running, I want to ask the user to give me some input, um, which uh, I think begs that the, there's maybe something in the resolution input side that we should be thinking about in addition to the um, the config templating that you were talking about. But I think both, depending on where this particular user is coming from, I think either or both of those things could be a good approach for them. Yeah, my, my only, um, my only suggestion here is that the runtime config template um, is that, that feature that you're talking about where like uh, resolute where it comes into resolution or even having the operator wait for the configuration to be available before continuing is something that can be like created as a shim layer on the operator. If that makes sense, maybe they're orthogonal. No, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, that makes sense too. It's definitely worth walking through different solutions for this and um, prototyping out what would work for different users. Okay. Do you um, remember what the, um, I remember the old config story. Do you remember where that landed, Evan? I think it just landed as, um, you know, it's the responsibility of the operator to start up and if it needs data, it should have a way to communicate that and write it out to the user and say, hey, I can't, you know, I can't create an S3 bucket for you because I don't have any AWS credentials. So first make in an AWS credential for me. Um, I don't think we attempted to address it uh, with anything else in operator framework yet. Okay. So this sounds like a fairly large, like there's a lot of scope to this, right? Um, do so. I don't know how we want to do this. I could put it in the backlog. I don't. I don't know if there's something that we want to do. And this is definitely not 018, it doesn't sound like. Is this 019? It seems like we need like an enhancement proposal for this, basically. Yeah, yeah if we're gonna do anything here, I think that's true. It feels farther out than that just because we it's a big problem that requires a lot of thought, I think. But... Okay, so I would propose we put it in the backlog. Um, would someone be willing to put a comment here that says like, this sounds like an interesting feature. Here's the other use cases around, um, the operator asking for user input ahead of actually install time. And then, um, 
I don't know if you, you said we had some other issues related to this, Nick, if, if we can, I don't know if those are public, if we can link to those, basically any context around this. And then probably what we want to do is say that um, this is lowest priority, but you know, the next step here is to create an enhancement proposal. Uh, I don't know what's our team process around like when do enhancement, like who writes enhancement proposals and, and like what, at what point are, should we say like, okay, please go write an enhancement proposal for this. I don't know that there's been a, a strong process, but this is one where I, I think there, there could be a disconnect between asking for the feature and getting enough background to write an enhancement for it. Um, right. So for, for those types of things, it'd be better if someone who's an active maintainer can spend time working on an enhancement. Okay, so um, I don't know if someone wants to volunteer to assign themselves. This is in the backlogs. I don't think we have to put an assign assignee on here. I think at the very least, if someone could put a comment here that kind of says what we just discussed. Sure, I can volunteer to do I'll that. do that. All right. All right, thanks, Nick. Okay, next up. Uh, actually, it's 1035 now. So unless anybody wants to have something specific that they see in this list they want to talk about, I'm going to switch over to operator registry. Okay. So re-enable OPM alpha bundle unpack uh, EDE tests. So I can talk about this one a little bit unless Tim, are you on the call? Okay, sounds like no. So um, we noticed that in the operator registry repo, the upstream EDE tests were consistently failing every time for every PR. Uh, we narrowed it down to this one OPM bundle test that we can't reproduce locally when we run it, but it happens every time in, in GitHub Actions. So for now, we've disabled it and we want to re-enable it um, once we have time to go look at it. Because this is a, an alpha subcommand, we were willing to, to basically just disable the tests. Um, so that, that's the background here. Uh, I'm guessing we probably don't care enough about this to do it by zero well, I guess the, the milestones here are different by 115. So I would propose we don't put it in 116 unless anyone disagrees. Cool. And I think I'm just going to assign Tim. Um, and if he doesn't like that, then. Have we, have we looked at the, I think those labels are out of date because I think we've released 116. Oh, let's see. Uh, one sixteen. Yes, we have. Okay, let me go fix that. Real quick. How do I do that? Oh, here it is. So we can close that and we can close this. And we need 1.17. Do we care to put dot zero? I guess we should put dot zero in case we need dot one and dot two. And we'll do a 118. And then this we will say is 118. Kind flake. Okay, that all looks good. Okay, OPM Alpine Linux support. Not working for Alpine Linux. Is this because of Seago stuff? Uh, 
I'm... That's a good question. Uh, this is a, a when they say it's interesting. I almost wanted yeah, to say like presumably it is a presumably it is either some kind of permissioning thing or some kind of um, you know like a dependency that's just not available. I'll take this one. Um, Probably libc. I think we build on Ubuntu, so it's going to link to glibc. And uh, Alpine has muscle instead, right. right? That sounds like it's probably what it is. Um, so what does that mean then? Um, is this possible to fix unless we build stat? Like, do we have to build statically? To support that? Is there a way to dynamically link to either muscle or glibc somehow? Well, uh, if I was uh, if I if if I was to make a decision about how we're going to support this, it would be we're going to get rid of SQLite. So then libc is no longer a dependency. I guess for existing releases that might be problematic, but I don't know if we have. Um, I mean, if someone wants to work on it, if there's a way to, to compile this a different way or not use libc, maybe, but I don't know that there's an easy way around that. We, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to add um, to our GitHub Actions a, an Alpine builder and output a separate OPM for Alpine. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's worth the effort if we're on track to get rid of SQLite in the near future, so. Well, the, the static linking was for um, was for our container builds, but if they're running on their machine, if we remove the static linking options, it should dynamically link to whatever they're using, right? Um, I have to. I have to review. We've, we've gone through so many iterations of the builds for this. I don't remember anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I'll put this in. This kind of seems like a backlog issue to me, but um, depending on what comes back from this uh, and how urgent it seems like it is for this person, like maybe a workaround is enough, um, but it doesn't sound like we're committing to doing this yet. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. All right. OK. Next up. Did I somehow, somehow miss that one, I think? OK, OPM index ad always fails with Podman with unable to read directory bundle blah, 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 metadata. I think this was something we had a bug for um, that Dan Sover had a fix going for. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, this sounds like an area that I was working in actively yesterday around like the uh, Docker versus Podman inconsistencies. Is this around unpacking the bundle? 
Sounds like it. Um, because yes, we did see issues where uh, unpacking would fail due to file permissions from inside the index container uh, being carried over to the host inadvertently. So for example, if you had like a uh, slash root logout uh, file, which needed root permissions inside the index image, and then you tried to unpack bundles uh, to the host, uh, you would you would try to uh, unpack that file and it would fail due to a permissions error. So that is something that I was, I'm not sure if this is exactly the same thing. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, this looks like index add, so it's not index, uh, it's not going the other way. It's going in, into the index versus out of the index. Well, this it is, still pulls an this image like, and unpacks yeah. it. Yeah. It still pulls in, that's true, right, you're right. It, it does do that as part of the add. Um, so where did I end up with that? Um, I think, Nick, you added that new unpack uh, container D implementation, right? Um, I think that was the latest that happened. Um, but that's for pruning. So I think that's an index add code path, right? Well, well I was asking about the, um, you had a bug fix up as a PR for a while. I don't know um, if that ever merged but you had one for uh, correcting the permissions on unpack. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I introduced that new, uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened with you. I, I can double check. I, I, I can follow up on this one. Uh, okay. It seems like, yeah. Uh, Dan, what's I your was, GitHub name? Uh, EXDX. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, this sound, I'm gonna put this in 017. Um, it sounds like we may have already done this, but Dan, if this needs to move out because we haven't done it, we can change it to a later milestone. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Unable to use OpenShift image registry with OPM index, bad request. Don't know if this has changed, but I know for a while the OpenShift image registry didn't support Docker v22 images. Um, so that might be a, a quick thing to check. Okay, Evan, do you mind just putting that here? Um, if it seems relevant, and I'll put this as okay. If that's true, then this is not something that OLM can solve, right? That would be like a is that like quay? Yeah, that would be that's a feature request for the image registry, or the suggestion is use a different registry. Um, but I'll double check on all of that and make sure that that's up to date. Okay, for now, I think I'm going to put some on here and we'll put this in backlog. Support explicit properties declaration in bundles. Evan, this is yours. Really good description. Enhancement for this, right? uh, yeah, we have an enhancement for this now. Um, this is definitely a one of those placeholders, so we don't forget completely about it. Issues. Um, it, so I, it, I would just tie this. Call it done. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I think the enhancement in March for this already. I recently saw this enhancement. So should we just kind of feature and then apply a milestone? Maybe link the enhancement. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm guessing this, do we think this is a 018 thing? Or even 017, I'm not sure. I mean, it's planned in our sprint, this sprint for us. Okay. I pulled it in as something that's required for um, downstream compatibility enhancement. Okay, okay, is anyone who's working on this? Nobody yet. I, I called out um, earlier in the week 
but to see if anybody wanted to work on it, but it's a two pointer or it should be. Uh, do we have any volunteers? No one else had time. I was going to try to do this in my spare time. So you can assign it to me if you want. All right. Kevin, you have spare time. No, but you know, <laughs> maybe it, maybe 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday, I'll get bored. Um, Evan or Kevin, would, would you mind linking the enhancement proposal to this? Or put the link to the enhancement yeah, proposal I'll, here? Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in a second. Yep. Um, I put it in the chat. I pasted the link to add that. Add that. Yo. <laughs> okay, I can, I'll add it to the, to the issue then. Sure. Okay. Detect common invalid annotations. Chris, you want to talk about this one a little bit? Sounds pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's called the top. I can't remember what this one was. <laughs> I thought there's a PR for this. Yeah, my team is actually well, correctly. John is on the call. He's actually working on it. He's, I think he's just waiting for it to get merged or something here. I reviewed this. Yeah, so the, the API change was done. And then now we're on to getting it into uh, into the registry code. OK. Um, so this sounds like feature. And milestone do we think this is like a f i looked at so i looked at this pr it's like a huge change because we're bumping the kubernetes version so one of the things i suggest is maybe we should split out the version bump from the ede changes um but maybe that's more of a nit i don't care too much if other people are okay with it but mainly my, what i'm asking is like do we think this will merge soon in which case we can put it in 117 or is it potentially you know, a couple weeks out. I think it's, I mean, personally, I think it's, you know, mostly ready to go other than the fact that, I mean, you, you, the comment about the, uh, the updates, you know, cause I'm pretty sure when I did the, uh, the, the pulling in of the API using, you know, go get dash U for the, for the API registry, I think it automatically updated the dependency because API actually is updated to the new version. So that's the reason why I think that came in. I think it goes and does a uh, dash U probably goes and grabs the uh, direct and transitive dependencies of everything that it, you know, it's pulling in. So I think it automatically updated because API got updated to the new version of Kube. And if we can not do that, I guess we can certainly try to do it that way. You know, I can I can back out the uh, the cube portion of the of the poll. Have you tried it without dash u? Uh, I have not, but I certainly can. Yeah, I believe what that does is it goes and it says update all dependencies to the high the largest minimum minimum compatible version. Um, in the build list. So without the dash U, I think it just uh, grabs the, the minimum viable version. Okay. Yeah, I can certainly do that and, and get that part of it cleaned up. Sorry, I think I totally cut out there somehow. Um, did we say which milestone we want this in? Um, I mean, I guess it's if you're if you're pushed for time or whatever, if you don't think you can get it in seventeen, I mean, I guess I don't, when was seventeen due? That's a good question. Uh, I don't. Obviously, we don't have one on the milestone. Maybe we should we should do that, but we're probably not going to do it right now. I think we we're planning to do it in the next what week or two. Well, and historically, we've been uh, not so great at lining up. Operator registry and OLM releases. Um, maybe it's a larger discussion for the group about if we want to start doing that. Um, 
because yeah, generally registry releases happen more frequently than uh, than the all-in releases. So I think I personally I would like to see it start. I would like to see us stop doing that because I think uh, that just shows that there's like a lot of churn in what we're putting out. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think to me maybe for now what we should do is just label this one as 017 since it seems like it's close anyway. And then if we have to move it out, we can. And then maybe we should have a larger discussion in the working group around um, like what our release cadence is. I know we've uh, broached that topic a few times and we've never really landed on a specific uh, choice, so. Cool, okay, that sounds good to me. Um, I've got you assigned. I've got the milestone added kind feature. So I think we're all good there. Okay, unable to run EDE test locally. This is from Camilla. So Ben commented, you've got to set kubeconfig directly. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I've got the, as part of the, the documentation, as part of my pull request for uh, for registry to update some of the um, the documentation around how to actually set this up and make sure what you're, you know, to, to make sure things are working the way you expect them to and whatnot. Um, so certainly maybe that would address it, you know, with here's how they'll make sure that this works, you know, these are the commands you need to run and that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm gonna actually link it over to that PR which is this one. I think it was 605. Yep. Um, so in my opinion, this doesn't have to be something we solve immediately, but if at all possible, I think the EDE test should just be run make whatever the, the actual CI job does well. Um, so yeah. I realized like in that PR, we've got a bunch of like, do these steps first and that's much better than what we have now, which maybe doesn't describe how to set it up in the first place. But long-term, I personally think like, okay, well, great. We've got these steps written down. Now let's go automate those. Yeah, regarding that, I guess that's the question I had about whether or not you wanted to but like an OLM, uh, you've got it set up so that the uh, the context, you know, you actually spin up a dedicated kind server under the hood, and whether or not you wanted to actually do that in, in the same kind of thing in operator registry, and we can certainly do that. I was about to respond to the, the in the comment about asking about that, but maybe that's something to ask here. Um, happy to go and kind of scavenge what we've got in OLM and bring it over to the end-to-end -end test in registry. So that way we can just spin up a kind server, do what we need to do and shut it down, throw it away. Yeah, I think that would be valuable. I don't think we need to do it as like a blocker for what we've got already, in my opinion. It's just different. Like the OLM tests, they run completely, the end-to-end -end tests run completely within uh, a cluster. Um, the registry tests, run on uh, on sort of on bare metal. Uh, they do manipulations uh, outside of a cluster. Really, there's only one end-to-end -end test that even uses a kind cluster. Uh, a lot of registry end-to-end -end tests, though, uh, push and pull from an, uh, an image registry. Uh, previously, that was Quay. Now we've configured it. The end-to-end -end tests run on GitHub Actions to pull from a, a local container registry that's also uh, running as a container on the host and that has uh, self-signed certs that the uh, host trusts. Um, so the, the, like the, the end to end test structure of the two projects is actually quite different. Um, I, I would just point, point that out as a caveat. And I'm all for making the end to end tests, like make, make E to E local run for operator registry. I think that'd be great. It, it would involve a little bit more like work and you need, if you want to use a self-signed uh, cert for the registry, you may need pseudo privileges to get your host to trust that. And that's even that is only on Linux. I'm not sure how to do that in other operating systems. So it's just, it's just a different, uh, 
different type of end-to-end -end test scenario. Yeah, okay. and I actually, in my other PR, I actually put it in the, uh, I tried to take some of the uh, SSL or the, the, uh, the, the fact that it's actually thing. a secured registry, uh, trying to take that into account and making sure that all the other parts of the code base were actually dealing with, um, you know, passing through the right arguments and stuff to make sure that the, the SSL would actually work in all the various contexts. So try to address that too. But yep, I, I take your point about the, you know, they do both. What my end goal was for both of the re repositories is to have a, uh, a a registry. I have another pull request into the uh, OLM project where the end-to-end -end tests there actually are integrating the uh, a registry into that as well. So something to point out as far as the other uh, uh, PR that I've got going. So maybe maybe what we should do uh, in the meantime until we make the E to E test more automated, what, what do we think about like having a fast fail kind of thing where if the make file detects that certain environment variables that are necessary aren't set, then it just immediately fails and says, you need to set these things. That way it's a more clear error message um, when you're actually trying to run the test. Because I don't know about you guys, I don't really go read the developer docs all that often and they get out of date pretty quickly. So I feel like if we put it directly in the make file and say like, here's what you gotta do, that's more likely to help people and get updated as we change things. So like a, a fail fast if the registry is not running that sort of thing? Yeah, or and it, it might just be like, if you don't have kube, like in this thing, like this is just saying like, well, you've got to con uh, configure kube config. So if we just see that and it's not configured, okay, send an, put an error message that says set kube config. But other, other types of those things could be helpful too, yeah. Um, I, I, the reason I'm bringing that up is I want to know if like we think the scope of this is more than just, oh, well, we're going to document it in 605 and we can close it as a result of that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. I'll put that comment here. Um, and so I think milestone is probably, that seems like it's lowish priority and doesn't really block any releases. So I'll put backlog. Um, this is probably... I don't know if we have, does anybody know of any good, this is probably a good first issue and help wanted potentially. It's like kind of a feature, but not really like a user facing feature. It's more of a developer feature, which I don't really see a label for. <laughs> the, uh... Shrug. <laughs> you want me to use that? I mean, like that's perfectly describing our situation. Okay. Um, I don't know. That's fine with me. I don't care. Um, all right. Great. Uh, so we're at the top of the hour now. Um, I thought this was super helpful. We didn't get through a ton, but uh, we'll you know, keep chugging along and hopefully we bring down the number of issues uh, over time and eventually we'll, we'll catch up. So thanks everybody. Thanks. Uh, Dan, Jim. I don't know if you had anything else. No, I just wanted to say this. I think this went really great. Our first issue triage meeting, uh, super productive. Thanks Joe for driving. Um, and thanks everyone in the community for attending. And uh, next week we'll have the working group meeting, which will be more free form. Um, but we plan to, yeah, do these issue triage meetings every two weeks and hopefully burn through all our GitHub issues. Um, so, so thanks, everyone, and see you hopefully next week. Bye.